Are you curious what a cybersecurity engineer making $100,000 per year does? Well, in this video, I'm gonna walk you through what my job was like and what you can expect in this type of job. But first, welcome to the channel or welcome back. My name is John Good, and on this channel, we talk all about cybersecurity. If you enjoy the content, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section below. Also make sure to check out the description for more training and resources. This video is part of a series that I did on different cybersecurity jobs that I've had. Make sure that you check out the other videos if you're interested in cybersecurity jobs. All right, let's get into it. So this job is working for General Dynamics, which is a defense contractor here in the US. And it was somewhat similar to a few jobs that I had previously. But in that industry, one of the things that you have to be aware of is that your job is gonna involve some type of compliance responsibilities. Particularly with this job, I dealt a lot with the risk management framework and developing and maintaining all the compliance artifacts. If you aren't familiar with what that means, Basically, you have to generate documents like the system security plan that talks about the system's purpose, the software, the hardware that it uses, data flows, and things like that. Also, you have to generate something called an SCTM, which explains the various security controls that are in place for that system per the NIST Special Publication 853 requirements. So things like awareness training, auditing, how accounts are handled, and even physical security. Basically, you have to identify what's required based on that system and then generate policy and verbiage about it. Now I did this kind of work in previous jobs, but with risk management framework, it requires a lot of documentation, especially when you compare it to other compliance requirements. With that being said, if you don't like writing, then you probably won't like the engineering role because it's part of it. So a lot of my job revolved around this. The other hat that I would wear was more of a technical role hat. A lot of times you'll find that engineering roles have architecture responsibilities too, so I found myself identifying what kind of controls were necessary and the architecture that should be in place to make sure it's secure. Typically, there's specific requirements based on that system, or you might have to review something called STIGs, which stands for Security Technical Implementation Guides, and they basically identify requirements. Something that was part of my job too was to lead tool implementations. So for example, we might onboard a new SIM tool like Splunk or a vulnerability management tool like Tenable Security Center, just to name a few out there. But then I would also have to figure out how to operate that tool and configure automated reporting so that we can continuously monitor the networks. In a security engineer role, you definitely are gonna get more exposure to a wide variety of security tasks because you actually need the tools or technologies to work and to solve a security challenge. Sometimes there's security engineer roles that are focused on specific tools and that's all you do. For example, you might be a security engineer for Splunk and you spend your time creating dashboards and tuning alerts. I just happen to have more of a broad role. If you're interested in becoming a cybersecurity engineer, I'd recommend getting a solid foundation and knowledge and then really start trying to learn about a specific tool. Something that you'll start to see is that if you learn one SIM tool, for instance, then you can pick up other similar types of tools fairly quickly because most of them operate in a similar way. Like I said about my experience in a security engineer role, you'll tend to have more of a variety of exposure as far as tasks go than if you're a security analyst and you kind of get the best of both worlds with technical and non-technical things. Okay, so the first thing that I wanna talk about is the NIST Special Publication 800-37, and that's the Risk Management Framework for Information Systems and Organizations. Now, in a lot of my jobs that I've had, this is one of the major frameworks that a lot of organizations use. And frankly, if you're gonna go into like the defense industry or work with the government, you're going to have to be versed in this document. Now, if we look at the table of contents here, you'll see some specific things. And we're not gonna dive completely into this document because there is so much to deal with this, but it's important to kind of understand the whole process. You have these different steps. So within the government, they have this kind of authorization and approval process for any kind of system that you'd wanna spin up. So if you were gonna create a new development environment or you were gonna have your corporate systems, you're gonna to have to follow this process if you wanna do business with the government. And that involves preparing your system, categorizing your system, so what kinds of data do you have, selecting the controls that you wanna implement, actually implementing the controls, and then getting that system assessed and make sure that it is actually operating the way you're expecting it to operate and in a secure manner. And then you get an authorization on that system. So that system is approved by somebody within the government and they say, yes, this system is secure. It matches what you say you're doing and the requirements that are in place. 
And then you have to monitor all of those actual controls and make sure that it's operating in an effective and secure manner. Now, along with that 800-37 document, there is the NIST Special Publication 853 document. This is the security and privacy controls for information systems and organizations. Now, for risk management framework, there are a lot of different documents and requirements for it, but these are the two documents that I really want to make sure that you're aware of. Now, this actually identifies specific controls that you have to actually meet for security. So if we go to the table of contents here, you'll see the controls. If we go to just the access controls, which is the first one, these are the AC controls, it will actually say a specific type of control. So this one is for policy and procedures. And it says you're going to develop, document, and disseminate policies and procedures to these various audiences. And you're going to do these specific things. And then it gets a little bit more detailed as far as what the actual requirement is and a verbiage about what you need to do. And then it will show actually related controls. So then if we go to IA1, which is a related control, this is again, policies and procedures related to identification and authentication of your systems. And you'll see these kind of relationships throughout this entire process for risk management framework. And frankly, this is one of the more comprehensive frameworks that exists out there. There are several other ones that exist. And depending on the industry that you work in, you may or may not have to use the risk management framework. But I will also caveat that with a lot of organizations are adopting at least some of the risk management framework because it is very, very extensive in what it actually covers. It covers all kinds of different controls, physical controls, technical controls, policies and procedures, all these different things, and making sure that you know who's responsible for what part of security in your organization. So I went and grabbed a few job postings that I want to cover just so you're kind of aware of what is in job postings for cybersecurity engineers. So on this, I searched for cybersecurity engineer and I pulled back a few that we're going to go over. So this particular one is working for a company called Periton and you're going to get up to about $190,000 per year indeed is assuming. So if we scroll down here, we can see a little bit more as far as the information on this specific company here. So in a cybersecurity engineer role, kind of like what I've said, you're going to wear a bunch of different hats and you're going to be involved in a bunch of different things because that engineering role really kind of gets the best of both worlds. So you get the non-technical stuff. You also get the technical stuff, depending on where you're at, of course, because companies are going to vary the actual job responsibilities for specific roles. But in general, that's going to be a pretty safe assumption that you're going to have more interaction with a lot of different stuff than you would if you were for instance, a cybersecurity analyst or a GRC analyst or something like that where it's much more specific. So in this particular one, it's saying incident management program, the threat intelligence management program, patch management, change management, vulnerability management, SOC management, SIM management. So a lot of different kind of technical areas. And then you'll see some different requirements as far as the degrees and certifications. So this particular one says bachelor's degree or six years of hands-on verifiable operational experience in these different areas, and then certifications like the CISP, CISA, CISM, GEAC certifications, Security Plus, and so on. All right, this is the next role that I found. This is Lead Cyber Threat Analytics Engineer, and it's for Nike. Indeed says up to $145,000 per year. If we scroll down here, now this is really based on threat analytics, so it's going to be much more about the data. But if we keep scrolling down here, we can see a little bit about the requirements that are going to be in this. So bachelor's degree, five years of information technology experience, and they prefer three years in a cybersecurity role. You're going to need Python, JavaScript, Go, something like that, a programming language. And you're going to be dealing with things like Splunk and some of these different tools. You're going to need a strong written communication and oral communication skills. That's going to be important in any job that you're going to be in. Incident response situations automated server configuration tools, so Puppet, Chef, and stuff like that, and then certifications, so the CISSP and GEAC certifications as well. So pretty similar, but a little bit different as far as the actual job responsibilities. This one's a cybersecurity engineer job, so it's actually titled that, and it's for the Navy Federal Credit Union. It's saying 83,000 to 156,000, so that's a pretty wide range. Most likely this is gonna cover a couple roles, and you can see here in the actual title, say a three or a four, because generally with that big of a range, it's not going to be one single uh, pay scale. 
it's going to be multiple. But if we scroll down here, we can take a little bit of look at what this is actually going to cover. Now, because this does deal with the defense industry or, you know, something that deals with the government, it is definitely going to deal with RMF and those kind of requirements. So keep that in mind. Again, like I said, that is very tied to the government and military and defense industry, but a lot of other companies will use it too. So it is something that you can take to other companies. But we see implementation, development, integration of DLP solutions, we see IPS, uh, web attack, experience of botnet detection, technical designs. So you're dealing with a little bit of architecture in there, development of cybersecurity requirements, again, design and architecture artifacts, plans, policies. So kind of like what I was saying in line with my experience. And then if we look at the actual requirements, bachelor's degree in computer science or IT or something related, at least five years of total experience in cybersecurity engineering, three years of direct experience in sensitive data scanning, three years with IDS, IPS, DDoS, CASB experience. So you need a lot of experience to fit this kind of role perfectly. But again, you're going to get to cover a lot of different technologies and a lot of different things. You even see things like routers and switches in here. So this is something that's going to have its hands in a lot of different areas. You also see a few different documents. So 800-41 and 800-43A. But you can see NIST Risk Management Framework. Again, those are the ones that we covered. And then CIS, CCNP Security, R Plus, Python, PowerShell. So you can kind of start to see some trends here. And then this is the last job role, but this is a Palo Alto Cybersecurity Engineer. So this says 120,000 to 130,000, and it's remote work from home. If we go ahead and scroll down here, we're gonna see something very similar. So we see some hybrid cloud environments. We see zero trust models. We see using things like Terraform and XOR. Keep scrolling down here. Automation, agile development process. So they want five years of experience. They want you to have cloud experience, experience with Palo Alto, Terraform, VMware. So again, that is the major theme with cybersecurity engineer roles. You need a lot of experience with a lot of different things. And even in those roles in general, if you don't have experience in a lot of things, you're going to get it because that just is inherent with that cybersecurity role versus something like a cybersecurity analyst, which is much more dealing with very specific things where you're reviewing the logs or you're watching tools and what they output. You're not actually configuring a lot of that technology like you might in a cybersecurity engineer role. Question of the day, which type of cybersecurity job are you going for? Let me know down in the comment section below. In this video, we walk through a day in the life as a cybersecurity engineer making $100,000 per year. Remember, there's a lot of different cybersecurity jobs out there and the experience might differ based on the company, but this was my experience. As always, make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Check out the description for more training resources and I'll see you next time.